one so loud in this echoing room, right? Before we begin, I want to remind, wow, that is loud. <laughs> Before we begin, I want to remind the committee members and members of the public to follow our code of conduct at meetings. This includes commenting on the specific agenda item only and addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in a conversation with the chair or council members or staff. All members of the committee, staff, and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Repeated failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb disrupt or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting may result in the removal of the meeting. This me meeting of the CED committee will now come to order. Can the clerk please call the roll? Ortiz? Present. Coming? Present. Torres? Present. And Foley? Here. Thank you. Before we get begin, I want to welcome my new committee made up of new council members. It's so exciting. Thank you, Council Member Ortiz, Council Member Kamei, Council Member Torres for joining me. And we have one vacancy which will get appointed after we have a full city council on Thursday. So some council meeting following that will get a fifth person. With that, um, I'm going to move through the agenda. We do not have a, a review of the work plan or a consent calendar. So I'm gonna move to the reports of the committee. The first one is a report from the Real Estate Service Division. It's the annual activities report. And this is a report that we get on a regular basis. And I believe Nancy Klein is going to kick us off. Welcome, Nancy. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Nancy Klein, Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs, and I'm here with Kevin Ice, who, who um, tends to and runs real estate services on a day-to-day -day basis. And I wanted to just for a second um, say hi to the real estate team, uh, Thomas Harris, Yen Bui, and Justina Chang, who are a small but truly mighty team. Um, and Kevin, will you do move to the first slide? Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of history on real estate and going to the way back. Real estate used to sit with public works, and no offense to our brethren in public works, but it was difficult. And um, public works at the time brought in about a million a year uh, for many years. And then there was a conversation that brought real estate into economic development into the manager's office and it really changed the lens of how we look at real estate in two ways. In the first year after doing that, uh, real estate earned the city $10 million in the first year. Uh, so revenue generation is certainly an important port. And the other is building a real estate team that's centralized that really supports the other departments. And we work very closely and very assiduously to help housing, to help parks, um, to help public works, and DOT. So we're definitely part of a tight team, um, of the four folks that you ha see here before you. And the type of activities we work on as a team uh, are on all kinds of fees, all kinds of easement transactions, leasing when we're both the landlord or we're the tenant, property management in conjunction with public works and DOT and real estate, and, uh, sorry, parks in, uh, in particular. Um, we, we represent and assist other departments in numerous ways from negotiating, leading transactions, getting appraisals, thinking through industry analysis. Um, total revenue for 21-22 is 7.1 roughly. We finished 141 real estate projects completed with the departments uh, you see listed, like Measure T for the public safety uh, facilities. And each one of those 141 projects encompasses numbers, many numbers of actions, plus there are a lot of other actions unrelated to those 141 projects um, that are information or analysis that the other departments need. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Thanks, Nancy. 
Uh, my name is Kevin Ice. Um, I manage the Real Estate Services Division of the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. Uh, for our overview of fiscal year 21-22 activities, I'll walk through the breakdown of revenue generated and highlight some key project accomplishments. The division oversaw 7.1 million in total revenue uh, for the year. That break, the breakout of that figure includes 4.852 million in surplus sale revenue. Uh, for surplus sales, the key revenue sources include the sale of 1500 Las Plumas Avenue uh, to the VTA to support BART phase two construction. The sale produced 3.817 million in revenue, uh, benefiting ratepayers of the residential garbage and recycling program. 460 Park Avenue was transferred to Parks Rec and Neighborhood Services for future development of a neighborhood park, uh, producing $390,000 in revenue to the general fund. And for the future location of Fire Station 8, uh, we originally purchased 575 East Santa Clara Street to relocate the station. However, after we purchased that property, the VTA informed us that they must have it to construct BART Phase 2. Uh, so we sold them 575 East Santa Clara and used the proceeds to purchase the property across the street, 601 East Santa Clara Street from the County Housing Authority. And these two transactions produced $455,000 in revenue, uh, which went back into the Measure T program. Facility lease revenue totaled uh, 1,082,000, which was primarily impacted negatively by the flames business. Uh, which struggled due to, the, due to the effects of the COVID lockdown and ongoing uh, decreased traffic downtown. Uh, the business has since closed and staff are working to find a new tenant in this large uh, restaurant and banquet space at the corner of 4th and San Fernando. Telecommunications lease revenue totaled 1.179 million, um, which was impacted by the merger of Sprint and T-Mobile which were two of our biggest telecommunication tenants. Uh, the businesses had duplicative telecommunication installations at many city facilities. And after the merger, uh, T-Mobile has been canceling duplicative leases as their lease terms expire. Um, I'll expand on the impact of the merger and work to offset the lost revenue uh, on the next slide. And finally, uh, real estate staff remain in the procurement process for the implementation of a real estate and property management database platform. Uh, this effort was identified by the city auditor as a key way for real estate services uh, to improve the city's cross-department cross uh, real estate organization and management capabilities. The work was subsequently presented to the Smart Cities Committee and placed in the purchasing queue for procurement. Uh, now I'll focus on some operational highlights for the year. Uh, for our telecommunication leasing program, I mentioned the impact of the Sprint and T-Mobile merger um, and with T-Mobile terminating leases. As part of the merger, Sprint was required to, to divest uh, Boost Mobile. Uh, so city staff engaged Boost Mobile uh, to take over leases at the locations vacated by T-Mobile. Uh, we recently executed our first agreement with Boost a multi-site agreement for four installations on city facilities. Uh, this agreement reflects over a year of work engaging Boost Mobile uh, and will produce $180,000 in revenue for the first year, uh, which will begin to be recognized in the 22-23 fiscal year. Uh, we have ad additional leases in development with other carriers and we expect these new agreements uh, to put our telecommunication uh, lease revenues uh, higher than before the merger of Sprint and T-Mobile. Um, next in our project highlights are key transactions to support the city view and park habitat developments along Park Avenue on the west side of downtown. We completed the transfer of the park habitat parcel to West Bank and associated easement agreements. Uh, we also, in working with the city attorney's office, completed the acquisition of Park Avenue parcels uh, to facilitate the redesign of Park Avenue and the city view development. We renewed the lease with the San Jose Giants for their operation of the municipal stadium for another decade. Uh, the Giants have been a great partner to the city. 
Uh, subsequent to the lease extension, they accommodated fire training cadets uh, during our transition from the old fire training facility on what's now uh, Barack Obama uh, to the new location just to the south of the municipal stadium. Measure T program highlights include the sale and acquisition of the Santa Clara properties I previously described. Uh, 575 East Santa Clara is shown here with the pin, and then across the street is 601 East Santa Clara. Uh, also for the Measure T program, we completed the acquisition of 1138 Olander Court uh, for the construction of Fire Station 32. A demolition of that site has commenced and delivery of the fire station is anticipated for 2024. And finally, uh, work done on behalf of the regional wastewater facility included receiving state HCD approval under the Surplus Lands Act for the development of energy projects in the plant's buffer area and for development of the industrial and R&D lands on the south side of the plant near Highway 237 in Zanker. Advancing this development effort is a priority work plan objective for fiscal year 22-23. Real estate staff also negotiated lease terms for the potential construction of a waste to hydrogen plant adjacent to the ZWED facility. Uh, so that's just a quick highlight of our operational results. A uh, more complete list of our 21-22 operational accomplishments is included in the memo to the committee, as well as highlights of our 22-23 work plan objectives. And with that, uh, staff recommend the committee accept the annual real estate services status report. Uh, staff are available for any questions, and we thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Kevin and Nancy, for that presentation. Let's turn to the members of the public first. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, welcome to the two district members, District 5 and District 3. I need no introduction to you. To uh, District 1, welcome. Welcome to the fight. And so we need to talk about racial equity within the context of real estate. Um, it's not good enough to have a um, land acknowledgement and, and propose like, oh, we acknowledge uh, this is a lonely land, this is a lonely land, and then just basically hand it over to Gary Dillabo and Eric Hayden and Jay Paul. Because that's who's running. That's who's uh, running this government and running this city, and pushing this policy. So let me give you an example. 460 uh, Park Avenue. It's that is a disgusting price. Three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. That man just stated that 460 Park Avenue was sold for. I would advise the council to please look at the parcel size and location of 460 Park Avenue. And you tell me if $360,000 was a legitimate sale. That land right there is worth 10 times that. 10 times that. And yet this guy is going to just come in and nonchalantly just throw around his, all of his rhetoric and state that, that uh, yeah, yeah, this is, this is cool. This was a good sale. This was good. No, it wasn't. It was a disgusting sale. And this is where racial equity would be applied in situations with having to do with land sales. Secondly, is that you have a, uh, an ethical problem. The VTA board that has been pushing a lot of these acquisitions, you have members on this council that are on both committees. You had Carrasco, uh, Perales, and Licardo that were both on the city council and the VTA, city and county. There's an ethical issue and a, 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 a conflict of interest embedded in those sales. So I'd like those to be part of the discussion and examination. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. Turning to my uh, colleagues, Council Member Ortiz. Thank you so much, Chair. And thank you to our great staff for the uh, engaging report. Uh, it's great to see some of these targets uh, being tackled, uh, as well as gaining the understanding of the work and climate that is affecting others, uh, such as the telecommunications learning, leasing, sorry. Likewise, I share my gratitude with the division and the enormous work produced in fiscal year 2021 and 2022, especially wanting to call out the work completed to house police department units, uh, including internal affairs, 
uh, the Gaming Control and the Family Violence Center as well as supporting the home key applications for the Branham Monterey and Arena Hotel properties. Uh, real estate services may not sound like the most sexy, sexy uh, topic, uh, but the work you all are leading uh, is making a huge difference to our families, especially uh, those most vulnerable populations. So I really thank you for your, your work uh, on this. Uh, not, in, not included uh, in this year's report, uh, the acquisition of this space that would later be the Delano Manungs Park. Um, the first park in San Jose to honor our Filipino American community was also brought to fruition. And I imagine we'll see that in the fiscal year 23 to 24 report. Um, though nevertheless, I wanted to make sure that I shared my gratitude uh, during this, during this oppor uh, opportunity, as well as uh, to thank division manager Kevin Ice. Thank you so much. And I hear that it was a process, uh, but ultimately alongside PRNS uh, staff, you were able to deliver on this incredibly impactful project for our district. So thank you, thank you so much. I, I share my sincerest gratitude uh, and look forward to seeing next uh, year's report. Uh, just a, a, a quick question, you know, as our city and regions are facing an unprecedented, you know, challenges in the terms of housing, stock, as well as land use, um, I think it's really important uh, that we understand what we're working on with and for internal uh, departments. Uh, to be working with the same information uh, before we can make decisions on how do we move forward with our city in regards to the housing strategy and land use strategy. As it relates to the procurement of the platform for the vacant land management, what is the estimated timeline and when we will see this rolled out? Council member, thank you so much for the mention. Staff, knowing this was gonna come up, has been in contact with the finance department and they, they share the concern of the delay. So they now have moved us up to position three from position six or seven. So I, I can't at this second give you an estimate of time, but it was cut in half. So um, we're super grateful for that. And just to say an extra piece, right, right now, um, a lot of us keep track of our properties on Excel spreadsheets, which is not great. And uh, there are other, um, software programs that don't speak to one another. So the beauty of what we wanna do is put in a platform that will proof out with what real estate works on and be able to create sections that parks or housing or anybody else could control and lock down, but they can be um, uh, maintained and analyzed across all. So we can look at what we have, what we don't, as well as what the maintenance costs are so we can engage more thoughtfully with public works um, and give public works an advantage in thinking through. Uh, so we're excited to, to get moving on the resource. Kevin, did I miss anything on that? I know that said it well. Um, I think there's a lot of synergies that we're going to um, discover as we start to build this out and, and opportunities to uh, partner more effectively with the other departments. Wonderful. Thank you for your answers. Anything else, Council Member? Uh, not for this item. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Council Member Torres. Great. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to to our real estate division for uh, this lovely presentation, and obviously Nancy Kleino as, as well. Uh, so thank you for for all this wonderful information. As we move forward, uh, Councilmember Ortiz uh, took my question, and you've already answered it. I think it's it's very important that we prioritize vacant land that we can, vacant land that we own, that we can use for housing, uh, that we can use for recreation, that we can use for, uh, for economic impact, right, or economic vitality. Uh, so that's, that's important, so thank you for, for 
doing that. And by the way, I love Excel spreadsheets, just letting everybody know. Uh, my old boss will tell you, but I love Excel spreadsheets and I love all the colors that come with Excel spreadsheets, but it works. Um, however, uh, I just uh, I do have a, a um, maybe hopefully it's a, a question that we're we're able to answer. If not, of course, um, we can talk offline about it. But um, when we sell an asset, um, who decides where the money goes, and um, why aren't we using uh, some of those uh, funds to offset the back rent of some of our small businesses? Thank you very much, and, and I'll begin, and we'll see if Kevin has um, uh, any other additional questions. The city looks for, we look for any opportunity to enhance and, and um, generate revenue for the general fund. If something is from a, uh, for example, though, from a fire department asset, though, and that's sold, those revenues go back to the fire department. Mm -hmm. So there are regs and rules um, that we, um, adhere to with uh, guidance from the budget office uh, as well as those departments. I do, I do want to um, mention, for example, council member, there was a, a member of the public who mentioned sale of 460 Park and the price. Um, 460 Park owned by the city, the parks department bought it for a park. So the use, we look at fair market value based on what the use would be, mm. and we work very closely with our sister and our brethren departments to make sure um, that those are reasonable costs, uh, knowing that that's going to come back for public use. So, so the way the dollars are determined um, has a lot to do with are we selling to a private entity or are we... Um, and, and that benefits the general fund, or is it for use by another public entity, and that use would impact the revenue that's charged? Great, thank you. Uh, the The next question is probably going to be a little bit more harder, and hopefully, hopefully, we we can figure this out. I'm very concerned of what's happening uh, on Fourth Street with flames. Uh, I know that there's some internal issues with with the former. Uh, owner of Flames and um, his back pay and loans. Uh, and so uh, for me, as a downtown council member, I really want to make sure uh, that we do not drop the ball when it comes to um, what's happening at Flames. Uh, I know that we've been, my staff and myself have been communicating with, with your office regarding, uh, regarding um, his you know, back pay of loans and uh, his ABC license, or as what they call it, liquor permit, for, for layman terms for, for, for folks who don't know what an ABC permit is, um, but uh, his liquor permit. Uh, I, I do not want us to lose that liquor permit, because if we lose that liquor permit, nobody's going to want to come into flames, because unfortunately, that's what brings fo some folks out, especially in a, in a facility like that. Uh, so... And, it's, and as you may know, for, for those of you who, who have worked with small businesses, now it's super hard to get a liquor permit. And so my question is, is and I think I asked this to uh, uh, Rosalind when I met with her last week, is if we, if that, if we cannot assist that uh, individual who owns Flames with his um, background and his loans, can the city buy that liquor permit and hold on to it until some, since we own the building, and hold on to it until we find another tenant for that location? I'll start. Um, thank you very much for the council, council member for the question. Two things, one, the city can't own a liquor, liquor permit. We have tried, but the attorneys are really clear with us on that. Uh, and this is not the first instance uh, where, where that notion has come up. But we are in very close contact with the owner. And part of the transactions that there are at least a couple of negotiations going on with potential new restaurants for the flame space. And part of uh, the steps forward would be a payment that would come for the new owner, uh, new business, to, to go toward the liquor license that would work 
uh, in conjunction with the prior owner. So we completely agree with you. That's another way of saying that. We see that as an advantage and and one of the few pieces of an advantage uh, uh, in helping transition from flames to another tenant. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. And just one thing to add. So uh, the Flames business has uh, closed operations, So, and, and they've notified um, uh, that the, they're not going to continue to operate the permit. That gives them one year to transfer to a new entity. Um, so, you know, that, that gives us a, a good long uh, window to work with to, to, to bring in somebody new and negotiate that, that transfer. Anything else? No. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on the liquor license with Flames. It is a critical business very close to us, and the value of the liquor license is worth something. But Nancy or Kevin, do they have to, anyone purchasing their, the liquor license, doesn't the back delinquency on a license have to be paid? And, and Johnny, maybe you can answer that. No. No. <laughs> the, the late, the, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. I, for some reason, uh, I thought that the delinquent fees, if any, were owed on a liquor license. They have to be paid in order for a license to be transferred. And there's no um, delinquency okay. on the license itself. Okay. Uh, we, we are owed in arrears for our rent. Understood. Okay, great. Thank you. Council Member Kamei. Thank you very much, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to go back to the uh, vacant land management, and I was just curious in terms of a timeline. I understand that you're uh, in the process to have this new real estate software platform, and that sounds really great, but I also know that it takes time. So I just want to manage expectations so that we're not here next year and we're still in process. Is, is it in the next six months, in the next year, uh, year and a half? I, those things I understand take time. And so, you know, it's one thing to say we're going to go out and purchase it and find out which is the one, and then it's actual implementation. So I don't know if it's phased or what it is, but I just want to, as I said, manage expectations on that. Because um, it sounds great. So, great, thank you for the question. Um, we really know that the city has been under a lot of pressure and procurement and, and finance and the IT team, but, but we have been on the list for the last three years. Um, and so we are hoping, and Kevin, we're hoping we get up to number one or in that category of number one within the year. Um, and then Kevin would know best what the anticipated time frame for RFP and implementation would be. Yeah, once we, once we get through the purchasing queue um, and we get through Selective Vendor, we're, we're building in a six-month window of, of real dedicated staff time uh, to work with our partner departments and, and build up that database. We, uh, we have all the data. It's, it's in a lot of different areas, so there's going to be a lot of work to kind of bring it all under the same house and have it, have it streamlined. So that's what we're planning for uh, whenever we get to that point where, you know, we're through procurement and, and we get to move on the software itself. As part of um, this whole process, I understand internally how you um, would organize it and coordinate it. I'm just curious in terms of, you know, with other agencies like VTA, the Water District, other, uh, you know, sort of areas, uh, will that be part of it as well in terms of understanding or just the city, just the city part? Just the city. Okay. And, and how do you keep track of coordinating with others like VTA and those that we have a lot of overlap with? Property-wise, since we are separate entities, um, those are separate. We are, clearly you're, you're aware that we know and occasionally when we're on a site search for an emergency interim housing location, et cetera, we're, we're aware of where their holdings are. In, in many instances, they may have a holding we're not aware of. Um, 
and then it, it's generally a case by case discussion about what that agency needs the land for and what they may be open to for our utilization. Or it's very much happened on the other side that they, for whatever reason, and easements, et cetera, uh, on a trail and there's coordination with parks that, that they need from us. But it's pretty much case by case. Okay, thank you. And my last question is on uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the sale of uh, uh, 460 Park. You mentioned that that spot was uh, uh, intended for a park. Now, is it going to be a park? Okay. Yeah. I don't know, Kevin, do you know the time for build out? I, I, I don't, we could certainly find that out for you. Okay. No, I was just curious because, you know, in terms of if it's for like uses, that's understandable. Um, and I just was curious when you mentioned it earlier that it was for a park and funds would go to the park. So thank you. Council Member Ortiz. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, when Council Member Torres was speaking, an idea popped into my mind. But has, um, has our staff ever looked into or considered uh, the possibility of utilizing uh, vacant owned city land for workforce housing or uh, uh, developing and offering um, below the average affordable housing rates uh, that the market has been able to provide here on vacant land? Council member, yes, and we keep calling. We The city, at some point, perhaps the council will allocate some dollars for us to go buy some land uh, that would add to our capacity, um, which since we also control general plan authorization, we could put together a bit of a strategy if there were resources. Historically, the redevelopment agency or the city has not done much land banking. Um, which we in real estate, of course, which we had been. But um, there has been extensive culling of the list, uh, and most of the properties that we have are remnant properties from roadway expansions, or, uh, and we try to use uh, a, a lot of creativity in how to add to projects in that way um, for housing or commercial uses. Uh, but we have very few properties which are either below the green line, not in a deep flood zone, uh, and or uh, that would make sense for, for housing in any way, shape, or form. And there have been successes where uh, in the last cycle, uh, housing uh, transferred, purchased from us four different sites. But we, with those four on top of a few that we had done a couple years before that, there's precious none. Uh, and we keep looking to see if we miss something. Council member, would you like to make a motion to accept the report, please? I will move uh, to accept the report. Second. Thank you. With that, let's vote. Ortiz? Aye. Kame? Aye. Torres? Aye. Foley? Aye. Great, let's move on to the next report, which is the Arts and Cultural Development Funding Overview. Nancy, are you kicking off this one as well? And I believe we have Carrie and Brendan here. Carrie and um, Bryce will ably Bryce, be reporting sorry. out to you. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Carrie Adams Hapner. I'm the Director of the Office of Cultural Affairs, a division of the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. First of all, Happy New Year and welcome. We're very excited to have you part of the CEDC. And um, so the Office of Cultural Affairs reports up to CDC, so I'm excited to work with you going forward. Um, I'm here today with Bryce Ball in the City Manager's Budget Office, and we're here to give you an update on arts and cultural development funding. So that's what we call our arts funding in the budget book. 
And um, we're here just to give you an overview. So I like to think about um, municipal funding kind of like the color of money. I use that metaphor sometimes when I'm describing it to people because different funding sources have different parameters and ways in which they can be used. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Bryce who's gonna walk you through the different funding sources. Thank you, take it away Bryce. Thank you Gary and good afternoon. Um, First, uh, we'd like to set a, let's advance the slide. Okay, great, thank you. Oh, thanks. So first, we'd like to set a quick um, funding backdrop for you all. When we talk about the transient occupancy tax, or TOT, we usually refer to it in terms of combined 10% assessment on rent charged on uh, lodging. Uh, but it's important to note that this 10% combined assessment is comprised of separate authorizations and the revenues are directed for different uses. You'll notice the color coding on this slide between the two graphics will also denote those separate authorizations. So the graphic on the left, we'll start there going from top down, uh, highlights the separation and also the general flow of funds for the TOT. Chapter 4.72 of the Munich Code establishes a 6% tax that's directed to a special fund, cleverly named the TOT fund, um, with half of those funds uh, received in, the, in that fund and then passed through the con to the Convention and Cultural Affairs Fund to support the operations of those facilities by a nonprofit partner, Team San Jose. The remainder stays in the TOT fund and may support cultural grants and OCA administration and programming, and then also convention and visitors bureau operations. And historically, this has been an even split. Now chapter 4.74 authorizes a 4% tax credited to the general fund for uses that are directed by the city council through the regular appropriations process. However, as you'll see on the next slides, a significant portion of these revenues is directed toward the operation and maintenance and capital repair and maintenance of additional city-owned cultural facilities managed by nonprofit partners, as well as intermittent larger scale capital improvements um, to those facilities and to other facilities owned by the city. Example of those such projects include HVAC improvements, elevator, roof, flooring, and parking lot improvements across multiple cultural facilities. Um, however, I should note that there's still a significant infrastructure backlog uh, to address associated with those facilities. And then if you look to the right, boiling these um, allocations down, you can also think of the 10% um, tax as component assessments. So you see the 4% uh, of the 10% for the general fund, 3% toward convention and cultural facilities, operations and capital, and then the 1.5% respectively for the remaining allocations. So next we wanna just highlight the primary city of San Jose funding sources for arts, culture, uh, and cultural facilities. Uh, again, within the TOT fund, there's 15% that goes toward the Office of Cultural Affairs that funds cultural programs, projects, public art maintenance, and OCA administration. In addition, there's a 1% for public art set aside. This 1% of funding is uh, set aside on construction costs associated with city capital improvement projects across the CIP. In addition to that, there is 45% uh, directed through the TOT fund to Team San Jose for CVB operations, and then also the management of city-owned cultural uh, and convention facilities. Uh, and then lastly, the component that we highlighted for the general fund, the general fund directly supports six agreements with nonprofit partners for the operation, maintenance, and capital repair, and maintenance of additional city-owned cultural facilities, and again, larger capital improvement projects. This slide details the recurring allocations from the general fund to support those operations and maintenance across the noted facilities, as well as the um, ongoing um, capital maintenance uh, allocations for those specific facilities. Uh, these are all per separate agreements with the uh, third party operators, uh, and those agreements include adjustment factors, typically 3%, which increase annual uh, funding for uh, the respective um, managers. Um, However, as noted before, I'll call out for the general fund that uh, it also supports intermittent capital rehabilitation projects uh, to these facilities and facilities that aren't shown here, and those can be significant. Uh, for some context, uh, um, over the past five years, 
Approximately two and a half million has been expended just on these facilities for specific projects. And then if you look at the 2022 Deferred Infrastructure Maintenance Backlog uh, Report, the current backlog for infrastructure improvements for these facilities is approximately 13.8 million. And if you include convention and other cultural facilities as well, that backlog is an additional 73 and a half million. Great, thank you, Bryce. Thank you, Bryce. Um, I'm now gonna walk us through the next slides and talk about the Office of Cultural Affairs specifically. So um, these are the revenues we have in this fiscal year's budget. We have 7.6 million in projected and rebudgeted TOT. Um, I think it's important to note that we, we have our budget based on projected TOT, basically what we think is gonna be coming in. So in some cases, um, it might exceed that projection or it may not reach that projection. So for, for that purpose, we also have some reserves so that we can buffer any uh, declines in the TOT, which have come in very handy over the pandemic. Um, and then we also, this year, because of the decline in the TOT, we had $2 million in ARP funding to supplement our TOT for arts grants. We have six, 0.6 million in percent for art revenues. And these are across a range of different appropriations. So as I was talking about the color of money, we have different appropriations and there needs to be a nexus with the revenue source and the art. So for example, at the airport, if there's airport CIP activity, we'll get a percentage of that, 1%, but the art needs to be at the airport. So there's a direct relationship between the funding source and the project. And then we're also very active in applying for grants. So we have about $150,000 in grants that we've received. And then we manage the O&M, um, the operations and maintenance contracts with the, the nonprofit partners that manage city-owned cultural facilities. So we have a cultural plan that was approved by the full council and there's 10 strategic goals. It's called cultural connection. I'm not gonna go through each of these goals, but I just wanna highlight a few of them. Um, we have one that is support residents' active personal participation in arts and culture, support the availability of diverse cultural spaces and places, integrate high impact public art and design throughout the community, and strengthen the cultural community's infrastructure and enhance support for creative entrepreneurs. So I'm gonna highlight some of the programs that we have that advance these strategic goals. This is not gonna be comprehensive, but I just wanna give you a little flavor of what we do in the OCA. So we have uh, probably our largest uh, program is our cultural funding portfolio, which is comprised of multiple grant programs. These are all um, competitive grant programs. The largest of our grant programs is operating grants, which provide unrestricted grants to our nonprofit arts partners. We have festival parade and celebration grants, take part grants, which are for programs and projects, creative entrepreneur grants, and creative industries incentive fund grants for arts-based commercial businesses. And I would say on average, we this year, for example, we have about 150 grants that are going out to artists, arts-based businesses, and nonprofits. And probably the most uh, visible uh, program we have is our public art program, which really a uh, aims to drive creative placemaking. This, of course, is Sonic Runway here at City Hall Plaza. And this is our most recent public art installation at the San Jose International Airport called XO. And we have about 400 works of public art in our collection that we also are responsible for maintaining. Another initiative we have is called San Jose Creates and Connects. And it's a program that's really aimed to drive uh, opportunities for creative self-expression for our residents, which will increase public will and participation in the arts. So we do this through a number of different ways. We have a month-long uh, creativity challenge. It's called We Create 408. This year we had it in October, where every day there's a different prompt that encourages, you, encourages people to be creative in their everyday lives. 
Another program we have is Make Music San Jose, which happens annually on the summer solstice. So we uh, encourage all of our council members to get involved and all of our residents. Anywhere can be a venue and anybody can participate. We also permit, authorize, and produce outdoor special events. So the OCA serves as like a one-stop shop for event organizers. They apply to the OCA uh, with their event plans, and then OCA coordinates with different city departments to get permits and authorization. So uh, this year, we had about 500 event days, and um, we, we're calling it in our office the Roaring 22s last year because events are back to pre-pandemic levels. So there's a lot of new events coming out. So that's very positive. It helps drive community and it helps drive the economy. We also produce events like uh, City Dance in partnership with the San Jose Museum of Art. That'll be in the warmer months beginning in June where we have a, an outdoor dance lesson with different genres. And then we have live music and it's free. We produce the Cornerstone of the Arts Awards, which happens in October, in which we celebrate arts leadership in the city of San Jose. So part of the rationale for us being here today, it's important to give you background, but we wanted to make sure that this committee had some context because as part of the June budget message, we did get direction to come back to the full council. And specifically, the direction was, to the, city manage, to the city manager to invest in revitalizing our arts, hospitality, and visitor sectors to spur business recovery, job growth, and economic fiscal health by identifying long-term budget policy strategies that can guide to the continued long-term investment of our TOT program that serves the art, culture, and hospitality industries and return back the next fiscal year to counsel with these strategies. So we are currently in the process, the administration, our department is working very closely with the budget office and the city manager's office to do some historical analysis. We're looking at historical data. And then in addition to that, we're looking at opportunities that we can recommend to the full council. So we're in the process of doing that analysis now, and we will be developing a memo that will come out in the form of an information memo in the month of February. And uh, the intent is that it will be released prior to the development of the March budget message. So with that, um, that concludes our overview and we'll open it up for any questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Carrie and Bryce. That was really informative and we all know how important the arts community is to the vibrancy of the city of San Jose and the enrichment of our residents. So thank you, thank you for that. And also uh, the information about the budget message and your ask for the future will be, uh, you answered my question, which was, are you submitting an info memo Yes, and in February. So we'll be seeing that and then looking for how the mayor responds to that in the budget process when he delivers his March message. With that, let's uh, move to the public for any public comments. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Equity, equity, equity. Ms. Hapner, you failed to talk about that. That's okay. Look forward to 5.30's meeting today because we're going to have five people from my community. Murals and equity are going to be on the agenda today for the Arts Commission. They're going to be there. You conspicuously refuse to address that issue with respect to murals. And in fact, since we are my community has been the primary uh, segment of the population, the Chicano community and the Mexicano community has been literally excised, wiped over, painted over in San Jose, I would expect you to be a proponent of the restoration of this erasure of my cultural heritage. I mean, since we're all equitably uh, uh, minded and principled, I think that your lack thereof 
and addressing that issue within the context of these budget allocations needs to be discussed. That's number one. Number two, $150,000 from philanthropists in the richest, oh my God, we talk about this area as, oh, this is the richest, most vibrant, oh, we're just so generous. That right there, $150,000 from philanthropists, you should tell them to just go ahead and keep their pocket change. We don't need it. We don't need it because that's a slap in the face considering the kind of tax breaks and allocations that are given to them in so that they can continue to do business here. So I want to hear about equity because I want some murals. I got, I got a lot of ideas. In fact, I want the city to sponsor a lowrider event that I have planned for this year. So I want some, uh, you know, I want some support on that because I think lowrider community and the lowrider, uh, Back to the committee. Thank you, Council Member Ortiz. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you so much, staff, for uh, the presentation. Art and culture is um, a topic that's really important to our, our city, um, as well as uh, District 5, so thank you for this really crucial work. And as, a, as an East San Jose native, I've seen our creative community in District 5 breathe life and creation in, into this city. Now we're home to talented muralists, poets, photographers, performers. Truly, we, we house a gamut of creatives um, and who have gifted us uh, in an authentic way, a piece of their spirit. You know, uh, it's, however, it's not unique just to East San Jose. There are areas throughout this, this city, whether it's Guadalupe, Washington, whether it's Cadillac, Winchester, Seven Trees, where the diversity in our community is strength and it shows through artistic uh, uh, um, expression. Um, you know, in that understanding, you know, I urge uh, us that we make sure that as we sift through these reports, we hold space and, and think about who's not being included in, in, these, in these conversations. Where are the up and coming muralists from downtown, from Cadillac Winchester, from East San Jose, who haven't been able to hit their break uh, in obtaining a big city contract, right? Um, and what is, you know, barring them from gaining that contract? You know, point blank, I believe there, there are barriers for some individuals to be a part of this discussion. And I think it, it's important for us to look and identify what those barriers are, you know, just as, you know, an example, not saying this is an issue, but uh, are our contractual agreements uh, a burden on some smaller murals? Those are the things that I hope we could start looking at. How are we ensuring that developing artists are gaining the proper professional portfolio um, that is needed, right, to even make them eligible to be considered for uh, a project? Two of the cultural development funding priorities uh, that I read states support uh, residents' active personal participation in the arts and culture and support the availability of diverse cultural spaces and places throughout the community. This, this makes me think of two questions, well, one comment or I, I, idea and then a, a, a specific question. So I'm interested in seeing what a potential pipeline could look like for up and coming artists, you know, who are from, you know, our, our, our neighborhoods um, and our, you know, whose talent is really forged in the unique experience of living in these, these diverse neighborhoods, right? These are voices that simply, uh, they cannot be told by other individuals unless you've lived a specific struggle. So what would that look like if the city's ever thought of that? As well as understanding how, you know, the funding is allocated to local artists. What's the criteria or, or organization? Thank you. Thank you, council member. I love this question. I'm so glad that you asked it and gave me the opportunity to address this because that, that was a very high level overview. overview. So, um, you know, local artists and local nonprofits are really what I describe as the backbone of our cultural community. You know, art, you can't have a cultural community without artists. Right, so they're fundamental to what we do. So we do a lot of different things to um, 
really build and promote and build that pipeline, as you mentioned. I like that description. So with percent for art, public art specifically, um, there's a couple different ways in which we do that. So we have a public art program director that does regular uh, workshops and education with local artists. And actually we collaborate with other Bay Area public art programs and do a workshop series. A lot of technical assistance. Um, and then we even, you know, he speaks at local community colleges as well. Um, we had a, we do, we try to develop different types of opportunities that, you know, maybe to, the field of public art is very uh, broad, right? And sometimes it requires a lot of technical skills. So enable to, in order for artists to start engaging in that, you need to have sort of like some entry points, right? So during the course of the pandemic, for example, we had a uh, exhibition at the airport. Rather than do some large infrastructure project, we decided to do more of a workforce, a creative workforce development opportunity. And we asked, we did a call to artists, and we asked local artists to respond to the time. And we actually had 97 different artists that were on exhibit, and they all got paid for their work. So that's one example. Another example we have is we have a, for about five years now, we have a new program. I didn't mention this, but it's called, I should have. It's called the Creative License Ambassador Program, in which we commission local artists to be ambassadors on behalf of the city to the community to promote creative expression for the entire year. And they receive uh, about $9,000 or $9,500. This fiscal year, we increased it. So um, those are all local artists of different backgrounds Backgrounds, different disciplines, and they all are presenting different projects. And there's actually development of a, a nice set of a cohort, right, amongst them. And then they're out there and they're presenting their work. And I have seen as a result of that, um, some of, for example, one of our creative ambassadors from last year, she just got a, a fantastic new job working for an important organization called the Center for Cultural Innovation. So I'm seeing, um, in fact, we hired in the OCA, one of our creative ambassadors from last year. So there's a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of upward economic mobility as a result of these programs. Thank you. I'd love to follow up maybe offline to see how our office could support and we could work together to diversify in a, pipe, a pipeline. Thank Great. you. I'd enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Torres. Great. Thank you. I, I definitely echo everything that uh, Council Member Ortiz mentioned. Uh, I think it, we, need to, we need to make it easier for uh, our muralist and our artists uh, and our arts organizations uh, who, who need that little extra support to have easy access to grant monies and funding from, from our city. Uh, and so, you know, we've, we've worked together for a very long time and I know that, uh, uh, that, that that's currently happening in our, in our arts, uh, in our o OCA. Uh, but for me, what I'm particularly concerned is uh, is if we do not have the money, uh, we cannot fund our arts and culture. And as a downtown council member, I am particularly concerned that we, uh, that our TOT reserves are still not at the level of uh, the pre-pandemic levels, I should say. Uh, I know that our events are, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but our TOT is not. And without our TOT, then we can't fund uh, OCA, we can't fund muralists, we can't fund uh, our arts organizations. So, so um, I, I do have, there's, there's uh, a couple, maybe three questions that I have where we hopefully are, are able to, 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 I shouldn't say figure this, figure this out, but redirect or maybe hopefully get some funds uh, going. Um, so I have, I have a question. The, the the one percent of capital improvement funds, uh, I know it's only one percent, but has there been talk of increasing that? Thank you for that question. Just by way of background, um, 
The ordinance in the city of San Jose used to be 2% of CIP. However, it was more restricted. So around 2008, 2009, we revised our ordinance and we made it apply to a greater amount of CIP projects. And, but we kind of negotiated, we'd, we would lower the percentage, which when we did our analysis at the time, that would actually generate a, a larger amount of funding for the program. Great. So when you say ordinance, that means it, w we would, it would go to the ballot box or we can do it mm -hmm. off on the dais? It's a city council vote. Okay. Yeah. Great. I like the sound of that better. <laughs> uh, the, the other one is, um, I know a little bit more controversial one, and, and I know that, um, uh, that our city has, uh, has put it at the back burner for, for many years, especially since since uh, I, as a, pol as a council assistant or council aide or policy assistant, whatever my title was, we worked on it, which is the 1% for, from the private development. Where, where is that at as on the, is that no longer on the back burner? Is it moving forward? Is it, what's the status? Yeah, thank you for that question. So yes, uh, the city council did vote to uh, include the, the exploration of a private percent for art requirement as part of their council priorities. Um, because of the pandemic and the recovery work that we needed to do, that did take precedent. So it is um, what you describe as the priority backlog list. Um, it's on there. There's 10, I believe, priorities that have been backlogged um, pending um, the the recovery work. Okay. So it's just it's it's just going to have to be a certain council member or certain council members to keep continue to keep pushing it forward then you know i believe that every year the 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 priorities get presented to the full council so i would say it would be probably uh, looked at at that time okay and go ahead nancy but i was going to add an update or a change to the priorities but go ahead that may be where you're going thank you madam chair just a quick note um San Jose definitely wants to and needs to invest, we believe passionately, more in the arts. We are second to none. The only thing in terms of the, the authenticity and beauty of our arts and cultural community, and, and we lack dollars. That, that is the difference, not lack of the quality uh, and meaning we have here. And, um, because you have many priorities that sometimes compete with one another. It's also a question of timing. The, the private development, certainly for residential and for commercial, uh, is already at a max. So they, we can't pencil housing, for example. So adding costs, the timing is something council also needs to consider. Uh, but, but a strategy to get there um, is important, no doubt. Great, thank you, thank you, Nancy. I know, I know that San Jose cannot thrive or cannot be vibrant without our arts community or our art scene, and so that that we know is important. What I'm also really nervous is, uh, you know, I know we're we're moving away from this uh, pandemic. What I'm afraid is is losing the two million dollars of the American Rescue Plan funding. Um, that funding's going to dry out, uh, right? Yes, it's all uh, been uh, executed okay. and okay. paid. Yeah, so, in yeah, this so, fiscal year. Yeah, so I'm I'm uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a visual person, and so my my question is my 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 question is this, um, and I agree I completely agree with. With um, with Paul on 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 this one, uh, one hundred fifty thousand dollars from our from from uh, one hundred thousand uh, dollars is not enough in you know the high tech capital of the world. Uh, I wholeheartedly believe that we we as a city need to be aggressive in in seeking more grants for our arts uh, and culture community because one hundred fifty thousand is really 
as he's called it, I think chump change or whatever it may be, whatever you might have called it. Um, and so I'm not sure if, if we have a dedicated like grants director uh, in, in OECA, OCA or anywhere in our departments to, uh, that actually aggressively seek out uh, grants from many of the you know, corporations that call San Jose home. Thanks for the question. We do not have a development uh, staff member in the Office of Cultural Affairs. However, we do have staff that are actively applying for different programs. So that 150 was just, you know, this year alone, every year it ebbs and flows. A lot of the uh, grants that we receive are project-based. So uh, maybe we've expended the funds, but we're routine routinely applying to the National Endowment for the Arts, the California Arts Council. Uh, we've received funding from the Knight Foundation, uh, Packard, as well as Hewlett and others. Right, uh, thank you for that. Um, another item that caught my attention was the 400 displays of art that our city of San Jose operates, owns, looks after. Um, just wondering if we can possibly get a list of those and what, where they fit in the, uh, in what council districts they are. Um, because whether Paul says it, whether council member T says it, whether it's our artists out in the east side or in downtown San Jose, uh, our Latino community here, uh, is being erased, uh, and it's and it's very unfortunate because we have our murals being painted. And I know it's hard on private property. I know most of the 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 the, the acts of violence on, on art have happened on private property. I just don't want as a city to get to the point where, if an art piece or a mural that's on city property gets painted over, and there's you know public outcry. Uh, we definitely don't want to get to that, so I think that's why having a list or you know an Excel spreadsheet, I love Excel spreadsheets. Uh, if we have that, uh, I think it's it's important so we can pr further prevent erasure, displacement of our of our of our communities of of color. Thank you, and I, I could spend an hour with you talking about murals because we've done a lot of work on this, but just very quickly I want to mention we do have all of our uh, public art collection on the Office of Cultural Affairs uh, city website. If you click on public art, you can see all of the artwork across the city. Um, in addition to that, uh, we do have um, a lot of mural projects coming up, one in every council district. So. We just hired our staff, so we're gonna have a lot more. And you're right, the, the mural that was painted over, it was on private property, it happened overnight. But one of the things we um, are very interested in doing is having a local artist, a local photographer, go and photograph uh, murals that are on private property. So we've started that process with a great photographer so we can document them. So um, just stay tuned. There's a lot of additional murals that are coming up, and it, we're going to be uh, pulling from our mural roster, which is a pre-qualified mural roster for regional muralists. So they're all going to be from the Bay Area uh, and across the districts. And, and just one, one last one. I met with Team San Jose. Sorry, Mr. Chair, Madam, Madam Chair. I'm almost, almost done. Uh, but this is... If if we if we cannot <laughs> if we can't get this right, uh, you know then then our downtown and our arts community suffers. I met with uh, Team San Jose, and they told me that they have over fifty million dollars in marketing. San Francisco has fifty million dollars in marketing for big conventions or special events to come into San Francisco. Fifty million dollars, and we have a million. That is ridiculous. Definitely not blaming you or not blaming anybody here in the city of San Jose, but for us to market San Jose with only a million dollars, with all the talent that we have here, we need to, we need to be investing more in, in marketing than San Francisco. It's, it, I mean, no, I'm not bashing on San Francisco, but we are, we are a gem, we are the jewel. And, and we are the city definitely with the most uh, culture. So, so a million to, to 50 million is, is mind-boggling, to say the least. 
Thank you for that. So that marketing budget is specifically tied to the projected TOT, um, which does, of course, ebb and flow. And so right now, we're, as we're kind of climbing out of the pandemic, I expect that to grow. Do we have, do we have, uh, well, maybe that's another question, but I'll, I'll talk offline with you <laughs> so we can get the meeting going. Thank you. We will be having an update from Team San Jose in a couple of months, and that would be appropriate to raise that issue with Team San Jose when that comes to us as well. I'm not sure when it's on the work plan, but I know it's there. March 27th. <laughs> I know yes. it's there. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anything else? No. Okay, no, great. Thank no you. no problem. Council Member Kamei. Thank you, and I'll be brief. What you do is critically important, so thank you so much for all of the work that you do and what your team does. Um, you know, one of the things that sort of popped up as Council Member Torres was talking about budgeting and the funding and all of that, and we know some of that funding is going to go away, uh, and we certainly, you know, want to continue to provide what the services that and the the art that that we've had in the past. Um, what is the team doing to be able to compensate? I mean, two million dollars is two million dollars. That's a lot of money. Uh, and so, just curious. I know that it's going to take time for recovery, uh, but it's sort of we're all sort of intertwined in this, right? We need for people to come in to be able to. Uh, get the TOT dollars to be able to fund our uh, arts and cultural projects. So I, I was just wondering, what's the plan? Uh, because I think that if every department were to be in a similar situation and we have to turn to the general fund, there's not enough for everybody. So I just was curious. So if I may, I'll just provide some context in terms of how TOT is currently tracking for the fiscal year through the first half, and then Great. what our outlook is currently for the remainder of the year. And um, thankfully, uh, after a, a very difficult period in which TOT revenues have sharply declined due to the impacts of Can the pandemic. Can you speak more into the mic? Due yes. to the impacts of the pandemic, TOT revenues obviously sharply declined. Right. Um, thankfully, relative to the forecast, which we believe to be fairly conservative for 22-23, um, revenues through the first half of the year are actually 77.5% higher than they were last year. Oh, so wonderful. performance has been very strong through the first half, and we are very hopeful that that will continue. Uh, obviously, COVID variants introduced a lot of uncertainty with respect to the forecast. Uh, however, you know, performance to date has been quite strong. So if that were to hold, um, that would bring us, in terms of finishing the year, to a revenue level that was similar to 2016, 2017. Obviously, not quite to pre-pandemic levels, which were very strong and had just begun to plateau before um, COVID really uh, caused revenues to sharply decline, but we are seeing a rebound. So that will be a significant infusion of funding uh, for the various proportional allocations that we discussed earlier um, relative to what has been uh, available in, in the past two years, certainly. Well, that's really good news. I'm glad to uh, end on that note. I mean, I don't know if anybody else has any questions, but... I really think that that's, that's good news because there's always the danger that uh, you don't, you know, uh, get to recovery or it takes longer to recover. And so, you know, it, it, uh, uh, it, it can be concerning, but I'm really glad to hear that. I'm also really excited to hear that we're going to have a mural in every district because I think that um, it is something that um, families and communities just love. And, and it does provide a higher level of vibrancy uh, when you bring the arts into it. Um, I also would like to see, and perhaps you're already doing it, uh, what do you, you know, sort of how do you bring youth into the fold? You know, how do you uh, reach out to our uh, students who are, uh, you know, emerging artists uh, into the fold? So uh, I think that that's something that we all have in common to try to grow and develop. So thank you. Thank you. Council Member Kamei, I guess tomorrow you'll be vice mayor, but today you're a council member. Would you, would you like to make a motion to accept the report? I certainly move that, yes. Second. Thank you, and I, I'd just like to add that the work you do is so extremely important, but I also want to mention 
a source of grant funding available for the council members to push out to their districts, and that is the Lee Weimer's Emerging Artist Fund through the Rotary Program of Rotary of Club of San Jose. They offer uh, $5,000 grants every year to about five artists, and some of them are performing artists, some of them are muralists and uh, fine artists, so watch for that. You can even go on their website, uh, San Jose Rotary, I don't know, you'll find, you can find them. Yes, you can right. find them. At, at, at any rate, I know they had a big fundraiser last week and they will be looking for artists to submit applications. So when that's available, I'll push it out to you as well so you can get it out to your community because it is important to help our artists out, particularly, you all know I have a daughter who's in performing arts and I worry about how they struggle and now are finally getting people in to fill the seats and see their shows, but took a long time to get there through the pandemic. So with that, let's vote. Ortiz? Aye. Kame? Aye. Torres? Oh, aye, sorry. Foley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on to the last report which is the status report on Downtown West Community Benefits. And we have Nancy Klein. And is Lori with you? She's on Zoom, okay. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the council. Lori Severino um, should be on, and if you can promote her if you don't see her. Um, but we will be talking about the status of the Community Economic Development Committee's uh, review of our community benefits program for Downtown West. And for just a second, I wanted to give you a background um, for the, the new council members that the community benefits package that we negotiated as part of uh, the Downtown West project is, is very unusual and very progressive. We, we worked hard with the community and there were hundreds of people uh, engaged in thinking through what the community benefits should be and it is in addition to the requirements of uh, our normal project. So we got everything that a normal project would be required to provide and community benefits on top of that. And the um, notion is that we wanted to do two major things. One is avoid displacement. There was no, almost no, direct displacement because the development was happening, uh, is happening on parking lots. So it wasn't that there were cascades of people displaced out of their homes or out of their places of business. But the anticipated um, displacement when you have new people coming in that drive up prices, something we've worked very, very closely with housing, and Rachel Vanderveen is here with us from housing today, uh, is very important. And so the strategies on anti-displacement are um, really important and, and good work has been done and more good work needs to be done. In addition to that, we really wanted to focus on opportunity so that people in San Jose in particular get the benefit of the jobs that will come and training and education that will come so that we're, we're pushing for prosperity for all. So these are the two areas of emphasis that you'll hear Lori speak about more in just a second. So our, our um, Downtown West Development Project was approved in May of 21. The development agreement um, accounts for approximately 200 million in community benefits. Um, they are very much equity focused. Everything we are working on within the community benefits program is looking to benefit and, and assist those who otherwise have not had the benefit of resources. And with that, I'll turn to the next slide and ask Lori to step in. Great, thank you so much, Nancy. And just to quickly introduce myself, I work in the Office of Economic Development with Nancy. 
as the Dear Dawn Program Manager uh, for the last five years. My role has been focused on community engagement, coordination with Google and the interdepartmental city team working on the Downtown West project and implementation of the community benefits. So this slide here summarizes the $200 million and how it breaks down. The first two rows are related to affordable housing production beyond the baseline requirements. This adds up to about $15 million. The middle row is the Community Stabilization and Opportunity Pathways Fund, which may receive up to $154 million from the Downtown West Project if all of the approved office is built. The bottom two rows reflect payments to the city. Up to $22 million will go to the city over time as office is completed, while Google has already provided $7.5 million in early payments, that last row. So I'll summarize the allocation and status of this funding on the next couple slides. And switch to the, there we go. Uh, so in August, 2021, council approved staff's recommended allocation of the first $3 million payment. As shown on this slide, the focus was on housing and community stabilization. The first program providing additional outreach to residents about rental relief programs has been completed. The program reached thousands of residents, connecting them with resources and helping with applications. Staff is working to put in place the other three programs listed here. Specifically, the housing department is planning to open applications for the community-based organization capacity building program and to prepare an action plan for the preservation pilot program this spring. The housing department is also working on a contract with the South Bay Community Land Trust with the aim of helping them acquire existing buildings and rehabilitate them for low-income housing. Next slide, please. So in March, 2022, council approved staff's recommended allocation of the next early payment. And all of these programs are related uh, to economic opportunity and neighborhood programming, and they are also uh, underway. So first, the funds were transferred to San Jose Aspires for use during the current academic year enabling thousands of dollars to be awarded to the 700 plus students in the program. Next, uh, Work to Future is getting ready to launch the Paid Work Experience and Occupational Skills Training Program. This will utilize an earn and learn approach to train about 40 participants in HVAC and advanced manufacturing careers. Third on the list, staff is currently working on a contract with the Santa Clara County Office of Education to provide child care support for participants of the city's workforce programs with aim of launching early this year. Next on the list, the library department has hired the college and career pathways coordinator who has been building connections with internal and external partners and is planning for the assessment of city the city's college and career readiness programs. Last on this list, uh, community leaders are actively seeking res uh, feedback from residents of the Gardner neighborhood and surrounding areas to develop recommendations for activating the Gardner Community Center using these funds. So this is complementing outreach that staff conducted last summer. And the next step will be to receive the report from the community leaders this quarter and start putting that into action. Next slide. So of the $7.5 million early payment, the city allocated $250,000 to setting up and running the Community Stabilization and Opportunity Pathways Fund and the Associated Commission. So since March 2022, the City Council has adopted an ordinance that officially created the commission in our municipal code and has appointed the initial 13 members. This followed a staff-led application and evaluation process. So the next step will be to onboard the members and start meeting this spring. And an early task will be to uh, help the city select a third party fund manager. And following that step, we will work to prepare the first strategic plan. And on an annual basis, we will be reporting back to city council to provide uh, status reports. And city council also has the uh, ability to audit this fund uh, at any time. So there will be multiple checkpoints along the way with city council on this effort. 
That concludes our presentation. Uh, Nancy and I are now available for questions, and we also have staff from Housing uh, Library and Work to Future as well. Thank you. And if I may, I just want to thank you, Lori. I just wanted to add that uh, uh, council members may be aware, but just in case, the emphasis of the fund is that the fund committee itself will make the funding decisions, which is part of what makes our approach extraordinary. The council will have guiding guide rails that they'll put on by approving the five-year strategic plan. And as Lori mentioned, uh, there will be annual reviews and the council will have audit capacity um, if needed. But beyond that, the committee members will make individual funding decisions and there are members on the uh, committee which are based in lived experience, um, knowing what people in need actually need and they will be very heavily engaged in determining where funding is expended so with that just wanted to say thank you too to the other folks in the departments who are here with us and uh, we're available for any questions you may have thank you and thank you for that presentation let's go to members of the public first paul soto uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. It's very really important. For the last five years, I've announced myself as Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. And that barrio has not been properly analyzed. And the historical injustices that was forced upon it via redlining has not been amended. So for you to think that you're going to come into this barrio and say and throw your money around and think that you have done justice to that neighborhood is a lie. It is a farce and is a continued perpetuation of what racial inequity looks like. Because in a just society, we never allow those who profited from an injustice to determine what their sentence should be. We never tell them what, where they should do their time. We sit them down, we shut them up, and we tell them, look, this is what you did to us, and now this is how it's going to be corrected. Any just society would never permit those who have profited from an injustice to determine what consequence they receive. This is just very basic. I'm not saying anything that is outrageous. I have never been informed of any of these meetings. These meetings weren't public. You may have posted them somewhere, but they weren't public because I would have been there. That is my barrio. I have defended that barrio for my entire advocacy uh, career. And I will continue to defend that barrio because I know I read the redlining documents. I have the redlining documents. I've studied that, that neighborhood. There isn't anybody in this city that knows any better about that, about that barrio than I do. Absolutely no one. And I say that with no pride or no arrogance. I say that merely as a statement of fact. So we need to know exactly who is responsible for governing this. Back to the committee. Uh, thank you, Council Member Ortiz. Thank you, I guess I'm quick with the button pressing. <laughs> th thank you so much staff for uh, your very engaging uh, report. Obviously this is uh, the whole Google coming to San Jose is, um, is an item that's very significant uh, to families in my district. There's several neighborhoods in District 5 that are vulnerable to displacement. You know, I'm a renter, you know, I technically don't have a home of my own, so I'm vulnerable to displacement and the, and the rise in cost of living. So this is, you know, as, as this conversation continues uh, and, and continues, I'm glad that the community has a say on this board, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be following this very, very closely. Um, education and, and workforce development are issues very important to me. Obviously I was former on the County Board of Education and then I, my um, former uh, role was workforce development, uh, uh, public policy. Um, so it's important to me uh, to see that all of our residents are being given the opportunity to attain the prosperity that's supposed to come with 
uh, the presence of high-tech companies like Google. Um, in addition, it's great to see that the provision of childcare um, is taken seriously so that no one has to choose between the pursuit of economic stability um, or you know, making sure that they're taking care of their families in the now. Um, that being said, I do have uh, a few follow-up questions on uh, just some of the directions of the, of the programs. With regards to the paid work experience and occupational skills training program, I know that uh, I believe Work to Future is managing this, but is there gonna be um, specific providers that we're going to utilize for HVAC and C CNC programs? I'll ask Jeff Ruster, who's on the line, oh, to okay. share more detailed yeah. information. Yes, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the question, Council Member. Um, yes, we are going to be working with Goodwill uh, of Silicon Valley on that program. They're going to be responsible for helping us with the outreach to clients. The, all those clients will either come from low resource census tracts and or be low income, um, mm -hmm. and they will provide the training. Um, they will provide the case management, supportive services, and follow-up services. Follow-up follow question on this. Does Goodwill have a track record of training in HVAC and CNC? They do, they do. And we have actually, we actually work, we've worked with Goodwill throughout the years. Um, when the Corona Relief Funds were available back in mid to late 2020, we also did a work experience program training and some of the trainings were in the same area. Great, thank you. That's uh, relieving to hear. Um, my question is why, why the focus on HVAC and CNC and not high tech jobs? Should we not be training our residents to work at some of these firms that are coming in? It only makes sense that um, we build a pipeline for the jobs that, that Google is bringing into our city because I've, I've formerly worked in tech and, and to be honest, traditionally they haven't recruited East San Jose residents to work right. there. Yeah, we have multiple, that's a very good question again. We have multiple sectors that we work in. Um, including IT. We've done recently using ARPA funds. We've done some digital marketing training for youth and for adults. Um, we do other types of basic computer literacy training. Um, uh, and so this was an area where we felt like it was good for us to um, expand the relationship we had with Goodwill um, and really um, provide people that still with very good careers with career pathways and high paying jobs. But we, we do do work in, in the IT area as well with other resources that we get from the federal government and through ARPA as well. Yeah, un un unfortunately I wasn't on the council when this discussion had, but I definitely would have raised some sort of local hire with Google coming in, because if not, um, it's an impact obviously on our, on our housing here in the, in the city. Other than um, the skill set of work to future, or relationships, why, why else the focus on HVAC and CNC? Is there a prospective job growth uh, on these lines of uh, field? Yeah, all, all the areas that we spend our federal dollars on for training, we do extensive labor market on to kind of see what are the number of jobs being created going forward? What are, what are the career pathways and the training requirements? And of course, what are the wages associated with the different rungs in that ladder? So we train for people in high growth, high wage jobs. Okay. All right, well, I, I actually, as a youth, I went through the Work uh, to Future program. So um, just to give you a heads up, I'm definitely looking forward to looking at the metrics of outcomes, how many people who are going through this program are obtaining jobs, if they're obtaining uh, jobs that pay a livable wage, um, because we, we, we need to make sure that the resources we get from Google are act, act, actively meeting the benchmarks we, we make for our, our residents. Um, but thank you so much for your, your answers. Um, but the second topic is in regards to capacity building for nonprofit organizations. Are there examples of like nonprofits um, that would be ideal recipients? Like what sort of nonprofits are we talking about when we see like capacity building? And as well as um, is there any sort of um, regional restrictions on, on these grants? Um, is it just for organizations in like the west side or downtown or, because I, I believe right, even, you know, council, uh, council member Kamei's district is gonna be impacted, we're all gonna be impacted. The housing market in general is gonna be impacted uh, when Google um, comes. So I just wanted to see uh, what those criteria would be to get those funds. Thank you very much for the question. 
capacity building is a huge effort and an important effort, again, demanding of more funds than we currently provide. Uh, we, we focused with ARP dollars on districts three, seven, and five, and part of eight, because those are the areas we believe to have the most immediate and important need of folks who have not necessarily had mm -hmm. the resources before. The types of organizations, uh, we've done a lot with small business, whether it be pr prosperity labs or other small business providers, um, enterprise fund, others that, that do work with small business entities. The housing department, as you heard before, is working um, closely to, to help nonprofits who are working in neighborhoods. Uh, there are efforts, for example, with Life Moves that are going on mm -hmm. in the downtown. Housing works extensively with PATH, et cetera. So from an OED perspective, providing capacity building dollars to our existing uh, very able nonprofits and looking for the opportunities to add services where we don't necessarily have services. For example, I, I come from Detroit and there are a lot more nonprofits active um, and it benefits the community across a wide range of service needs. So we're looking how to target uh, both adding capacity to our very able existing groups and where appropriate, adding new services. One, um, one follow-up in regards to that is I hope that we could be somewhat flexible, uh, especially given the, the new council districts, because for example, an area that's gonna be really uh, uh, impacted by this uh, is Gardner, also known as Horseshoe. And that was formerly District 3, but now it's District 6, so I mean, Hopefully we could like make sure that like the areas impacted have those resources in them. And finally, I did see that a, an image of year up. Uh, students from year up was utilized um, uh, in uh, one of the slides. Is there a reason? Are they on the committee? What was what was that? What was the thought behind that photo? Jeff, do you want to comment first? On year up? Uh, yeah, sorry, Nancy. I don't know why you appeared on that. Part of the services of Year Up are different companies who are already heavily engaged with yeah. Year Up. It happens to be that Year Up is benefiting from space in Google property now mm -hmm. and use is actively engaged with many different uh, communities and several different sectors, including um, tech training, programming. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar. I'm a graduate of the Year Up program. I'm very familiar. That's a, that's a program that I know is very successful at preparing uh, youth from diverse backgrounds, economic and cultural, to be successful in the workforce, especially in corporate and tech environments. That's why I was like, oh, you know, how is Europe involved? But then to hear that they're not involved is somewhat disappointing. But I'm glad that Google is bringing them in. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chairwoman. Thank you. Council Member Torres. Yes, just uh, uh, a, few, a few questions. Uh, Councilmember Ortiz already already pinpointed the the uh, our workforce development. Uh, I think it is very very important. Coming from a union family, I know the importance of of, of being union and having unions and blue collar jobs, especially when we're we're going to build this massive massive village. But I also want to make sure that our younger future generation is working, not only building the buildings, but also working in the buildings. Uh, that's, the, that's very important. So, so I echo what Councilmember Ortiz just uh, talked about. We need to make sure that our most under-resourced communities, our communities of color, uh, especially uh, Latino, brown, uh, and um, Asian are working in these buildings after Google is, is, is done or completed or the office buildings are done. So, because uh, that's also, uh, that, that's gonna make sure that we're not displacing uh, our community. Uh, so, um, and then we have an opportunity here to really invest uh, in our youth. 
with this with this massive uh, development. And so I, I read here that there's going to be a co college and career pathways uh, coordinator and that we're going to be investing more in uh, San Jose Aspires. And I'm, I'm really, I love the idea that, uh, that already 375 youth are part of uh, San Jose Aspires. Um, how close are we, um, especially when this fits into uh, the college and career pathways coordinator, how, cl uh, how close are we to um, creating uh, our youth, uh, Office of Youth Development? Uh, I worked on that two years ago uh, under the Eastside Rescue Plan where we wanted to create a youth uh, master plan. Uh, how, how close are we to an Office of Youth Development? Uh, and I ask because we don't want to continue to work in silos when it comes to, when it comes to making sure our youth are not falling through the cracks. Let me begin here. Um, there, there are a number of different pathways that multiple departments are collaborating on, on benef activities that benefit youth. Uh, Jeff Shop is, uh, and he could speak to employment, resiliency core, and other pathways that are benefiting youth. And I believe that Jill is on the line to speak about the um, learning pathways coordinator and the whole logic and education model that is growing and connecting dots so that um, individual activities or progress made in an individual area is not in a silo, but works across um, areas, including uh, connecting aspires to uh, learning education programs and to additional grants for for college and I just want to stop for a second here Jill are you on the line with us yes Hi, thank Nancy. you uh, thank you council member for the question um, the college and career pathways coordinator did start in uh, mid-year uh, this year and so has been actively working on starting the, these processes that Nancy was just describing um, and as, as you know, at the same time, we've got um, the, a kernel of an office of youth in the city manager's office, working with our deputy city manager, Angel Rios, and that team, along with all the departments, are working on the children and youth master plan. So we've got these, these efforts running concurrently, but definitely in alignment and so what you'll see is that as they're both being developed, there'll be a lot of uh, connections there, which is I know what we all know needs to happen. So I think that um, another important point is that the this work around college and career pathways actually reports up through the Neighborhood Service and Education Committee. We did have a report in um, December, I believe. And actually, it was November when we did the last College and Career Pathways um, update. And so there's a lot of information there. We'd, we'd be happy to um, provide you with uh, some background on that, on what's been accomplished to date. Um, but just to know that both of those efforts will report through neighborhood services. So there'll be um, continued work to, to line up the, the efforts. The specific question about the Office of Youth Development, I think that needs to go uh, through our city manager, uh, but I know right now this is the path that we're taking is to to develop out these strategies uh, concurrently. Now that said, there's been a, a lot of work done through neighborhood services, which you'll learn about um, around ensuring that there is um, a, a citywide logic model for all college and career programming, um, as well as um, the development, our goal is to really develop those outcome measures that Council Member Ortiz was speaking to and having performance metrics that would report up through the committees. Great, great. Uh, thank you uh, very much for that. I think this is uh, super important, like I said, to make sure that we're, we're doing this right. It's a massive project and investing in our youth is, is, is super important. Uh, couple two more last questions real quick our city of san jose doesn't have a right to counsel right for tenants i would defer to rachel vanderveen there are certain tenant rights but okay cuz uh, my next question is regarding the the uh, rent relief programs for via for google west so 
So we we don't have right to counsel, right? Okay. Yes. Good afternoon. Hi. This is Rachel Vanderveen, Hi, Rachel. Deputy Director of the Housing Department. And to your question, uh, Councilmember Torres, the City of San Jose does not have a right to counsel. Okay. And so the monies that are used here, when it says rent relief programs, mm -hmm. uh, one point two million dollars, that is to help people pay the rent. Yes. First month, yes, last so month, monthly. Right, and what we've been, what we've done, it, um, really, this effort started throughout the pandemic, the pandemic response, and we were at, we had funds that we could use in order to provide rent relief. And what we've done now is kind of it's kind of evolved, and now what we have is an eviction diversion program. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is our team is at the courts and working out agreements between tenants and landlords so that they can remain in their housing. So it's a very direct intervention for displacement by eviction and then rent um, relief is provided to those households so that they can remain in their homes okay cool great thank you for that so my question would be if right to council will come to the city of san jose can we use this funding for that i would have to look into that and you know to to figure out if that would be something that's legal but I would also just have to say that the right to counsel, we we are working. Um, we have a a consultant who is working right now to try and scope what that would look like and how much it would cost. Um, but I would just anticipate that a right to counsel would necessitate more money than what is available for rental assistance. You know, it's, it would be it would cost more. So it's not. I think there's two questions. One, could you use funding for one or the other? That's a good question, and we would have to look into that. But the second question is, would it be sufficient? And that, sure. that may be harder in that case. Okay, great. Thank you. And that's, that's it for me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Would you care to make a motion to accept the report? Yes, motion to accept report. Second. Thank you. Then I have one question regarding Gardner and the outreach efforts that you made. Former school board member Gardner was, Gardner Academy was one of the schools in my trustee area. So can you tell me what approach you've used to the outreach in the Gardner area? Did you involve the Gardner Academy parents and could just maybe walk me through how you've reached out to them? Thank you very much for the question. Lori would be best to respond, Lori. Yeah, and I'll also acknowledge that Pauline with the Parks and Rec Department is on the call as well, and she might want to chime in after I give it a go here. Um, but basically, the, the council direction for this item was to really empower community leaders to lead this outreach process. So early on, we started working with uh, a few of the leaders who'd been active in the Deer Dawn area. At the time, they were known as the Dang, um, and so that uh, they have been doing a lot of work on this front. Uh, one of the last summer, though, uh, Pauline and I, the Parks Department, we uh, set up an online survey. We worked with the uh, the neighbor, the the night out parties that uh, block parties that the Parks Department was hosting over the summer, and so we piggybacked on one of those events to open up the Gardner Center and have an open house. So talked to dozens of neighbors that night and got, um, I think about 200 survey responses. Um, we also had sent out a mailer to advertise that this uh, opportunity to provide input was, was happening. Uh, so that was over the summer. And then this past fall, the community leaders uh, did their own focus group work and they're now uh, actively getting survey responses. So both all of this data is going to be put into the mix uh, as part of the, the community uh, report that they're working on right now. Um, they, they have been communicating with the Gardner Academy, and I believe over the next month they're going to be um, doing more of that type of outreach with the schools and the, the local groups in that area. Oh, and Bob Stedler uh, is part of that work, and he's also on the call. So hopefully that gives you a good overview, though. So just to follow up, if I could, so are you saying that the, the Dang group is taking the lead on this, on the outreach, or it started with them? I know they've been very much 
concerned about Gardner and making sure, in fact, they were the ones who raised, making sure there were additional allocation funds for the Gardner area. So it is Dang leading this? And, and I, I just want to make sure that we're not depending on technology to reach all of the residents of the Gardner area, that we go old school and hand deliver invitations to any meetings that we have and, and uh, highly recommend that we work through the school district or the school that has a lot of connectivity to that community. Yeah, I, they are leading it, but we are definitely coordinating. And so we wanted, we, we led some of the earlier efforts, but they have been taking the lead the last few months. And uh, so their strategy has been to also go door to door. They worked with some San Jose State students uh, to go door to door to advertise their survey. And we did the paper mailers, just knowing too, yeah, that electronically doesn't always reach everyone. So mailers and door to door um, are part of the mix. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Bob, are you online and you wanted to add something? Or enough said, okay, then let's I'm, vote. I'm here, Bob Stedler. Hello? Okay, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, so just to give you a heads up, so we're talking with Carla Collins with the trustee San Jose Unified. Uh huh. Uh, okay. We've been talking with the principal of the school. Um, we had San Jose State, you know, Spartan Beyond go door to door. Um, so we are planning on doing more with the school and participating in their events. And we have been going door to door with local leaders such as Pati, Palomares. And so we are continuing our effort with the city staff. Great. Thank you for that, I appreciate that. With that, let's vote. Ortiz. Aye. Kame. Aye. Torres. Aye. Foley. Aye. So concludes our meeting. Let's go to open forum. Call in user one. Hi, Martha O'Connell, Golden State Manufactured Homeowners League, GSMOL, representing mobile home park residents. Just want to alert the new members of the committee and welcome that the granting of the mobile home park designation for, I think it's 13 parks this year has been put into your ballpark. You guys are supposed to be monitoring that and making sure that it was happening and that vote was unanimous last year. I've had three meetings with mobile home park residents in the last five days. And at each and every one of those meetings, the number one issue was the parks getting the designation, which doesn't prevent parks from closing, but makes it harder and thus helps prevent displacement. So please guys, our eyes are on you and make this happen. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stadler, for mentioning uh, Ms. Palomares. So long as I know that she's involved directly in this process, I, I don't have any concern, none. So thank you for mentioning her. Um, I, I do have to admit that when I entered this meeting, I did not want to like what I was gonna hear. I mean, I entered the conversation not wanting to like what I want, what I was going to hear. However, I have been surprisingly uh, uh, challenged on that uh, thought. And I do have to say that uh, I am impressed. I'm not going to be, we're not going to agree on every particular issue. I know there's, there's things that go on behind closed doors that, uh, that are going to have to be beholden to. I understand that. Um, however, what the what it is that we elected you to do we have an expectation and what you can do we are going to demand that you must do and so um like i said once again I, I was very impressed by the questions that were asked they were actually i was surprised that they would be actual questions that i would ask if i were in the position that you're in now 
And so um, there's some sy symmetry there and synergy and consistency with challenging this government on the historical racist policies that deprive people of two things, economic mobility and education. You see, in the schools, they track Chicanos, which I'm of that generation. It's a generational thing. Um, they tracked us to go into menial jobs, menial labor. They didn't track us for the colleges. So I appreciate uh, Council, uh, Councilman Ortiz's um, uh, focus on that, is that I want, I want some Google universities, straight up. I want some Google universities staffed with Google engineers for that. Jill Borders. Hi, thank you. This is Jill Borders. I wanted to, I had no idea Martha would be on the call today in public comment, but my public comment is very similar to hers just a few callers ago. I'm calling in to just remind this body that, um, and all of the council members, that the mobile home community is really hoping to, in the next um, certainly year and the next several years, to have the commitments that were made to all of us to have those happen. And so I'm just calling to let you know that to thank you for serving us um, in the community. I, I personally considered running and um, or even turning an application and it's a daunting thought. And I, so I want you to know, I appreciate your work. I appreciate you, what you're doing for us and that you've taken this on. Um, and in that spirit, uh, I just hope you know that, you know, we're here listening and we appreciate what you're doing and hope that we will see the mobile home community um, have, have those things that were voted on and promised to us come through. And we're watching and in not in a threatening way, but we're watching and, and, we're, th and we're grateful for what hopefully will come. Um, also, I just wanna echo what Paul Soto said. Um, I think that there were a lot of comments made in this meeting that give me a little bit more hope that compassion is on the horizon as we understand that economic de development does not have to uh, come and at the sacrifice of so many, that we have to find ways in the future to understand that, you know, economic, economic development for um, all of us really means a compassionate look at what's happening to all of us. And so I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I feel like it's a, the beginning of a new time here in the city and we just have to move forward in asking all of these compassionate questions. And um, thank you very much. Back to the committee. Thank you. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you.